Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Google Hangout. I'm Sadanand Dhume from the American Enterprise Institute, and I have a great panel here today to discuss one of the burning questions in India, which is, is Prime Minister Narendra Modi an economic reformer? My three panelists include Mihir Sharma, who is with Business Standard, a leading newspaper in India, and also the author of Restart, a book about the Indian economy that everybody is talking about right now, and I suggest you pick up a copy as well. Milan Veshna from the Carnegie Endowment here in Washington, and Vivek Dehagia from Carleton University, who's also a columnist with the Indian newspaper Mint, who is joining us from Mumbai. So let me start with you, Mihir. Um, Look, if we if we look at Modi's record thus far, we have about you know almost a year into his government. Uh, they've raised FDI caps and insurance. They've passed reform in mining, in mineral rights. They've devolved more money to the states. They've promised a unified goods and services tax. Uh, would you say that's a pretty good record? I'd say that it's a very very effective set of decisions. Um, I think that where a lot of people have started questioning this government is that not a lot of these came from in-house ideas. Some of them, of course, are deep and foundational, such as the question of natural resource pricing. But again, that was um, the coal auctions were kind of forced on them by, by the Supreme Court. Um, the goods and services tax has been hanging fire for a long time, and in fact, uh, the Prime Minister, when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, was one of the people objecting to it. Um, so, but there are a bunch of things where you see, all right, it's wonderful that they've moved, but these, this isn't a new agenda. This isn't something that you think they will, that they've actually thought up themselves. Now, to the degree that you would assume that being a reformer means having an agenda that you believe the country needs in order to change itself, I think that that we haven't seen yet. But let me push you back on that because I mean there are things such as the such as insurance reform or uh, or the auction of resources. I mean there or or GST for that matter that has been hanging fire for a long, long time. So don't you think a government that actually implements things? which other governments have not been able to do for whatever reason, in the end deserves the credit for that reform. Why, why they do they need to have invented something new for, that to, for, for them to get the credit? They absolutely deserve the credit for being far more effective uh, than the last government, and in fact, in the case of insurance and the NDA government, the last NDA government, the last BJP-led government. However, I think if we're going to start looking forward, going to look beyond the pending and no agenda for reform to the deeper things that are likely to sustain entrepreneurship, to sustain business, the changes to red tape that have held this country back, this economy back for a really long time, I think that will require more than just the pending agenda of the past 10 years, to be clear. Vivek, where do you come down on this? Is, is Narendra Modi an economic reformer? Well, I will say that, yes, I think he is. And I think we have to be clear what we mean by uh, is he a reformer? Is he Margaret Thatcher? Is he sort of, uh, you know, battling unions and privatizing, slashing welfare schemes, cutting taxes? No, he's not that sort of textbook Reagan, Reagan, Thatcherite type of reformer. But is he a pragmatic, business friendly, investor friendly political leader working as, you know, to make regulations work better, as Mihir also said? Uh, reduced red tape and corruption. And in terms of new stuff, I mean, there is some new stuff. Bankruptcy uh, law reform, you know, something that really is flying below the radar screen. Now, that is a BJP or NDA government initiative. And if that succeeds, that will be a hugely important reform because there's so much inefficiency and waste and capital that's tied up in, in dead or dying enterprises. Now, that's something that no one's talking about. And that is a Jaitley uh, Modi idea. So there's one right there. Milan, after the after the budget, there was a, you gave an interview where you said that you would give it, I believe, a B or a B plus at best. Now, is is that your assessment just of the budget, or would that also be your assessment of uh, about the first year of Modi when it comes to reform? Yeah, I mean, I think that's generally how I feel about the first year. I mean, I think you know, at the end of the day, there's not been very much objectionable to what they've done, right? I, I think if you look at the budget, I think if you look at the reform accomplishments thus far. But I guess, you know, the thing that's sort of nagging at me is this sort of idea of gradual incremental reform is essentially the same 
a line that, you know, uh, Montek Alawalia coined, right, that there's a strong consensus for weak reforms in India. And I'm not sure that we've moved beyond that. And I actually think, Sadanand, you raised a really interesting uh, uh, question in your budget analysis, which was, you know, try to name one thing that took a, a modicum of political risk to introduce in this budget, right? And it's really hard to find one. And I think that is... You know, I think if that is our benchmark, then yes, you know, there hasn't been much to put Modi in the category of, you know, he is a transformational economic reformer. I mean, what do you make of this idea, this term, creative incrementalism? Is this basically business as usual? I think that, I think that they have taken a decision to not, to not uh, expend political capital on a lot of things that, on a lot of the things that we hope they would expend political capital on. Now, um, I don't think that, I think that the, the jury is out on whether they will sustain, whether they will stick with that decision, whether at some point, maybe a year down the line, they will decide that, look, we have 282 uh, seats in the lower house of parliament. It's an unprecedented majority. You know, we're going to try and push through some a couple of painful things. Maybe to, for example, the agricultural land market, or agricultural taxation. Um, however, as of right now, I think the Prime Minister has very, very, uh, to, to a great degree, set a wait and watch agenda. I, you know, I don't, he, he, I think he's told people I don't want to, to rock the boat excessively. Um, I've taken one big call on the land acquisition bill because that was on the top of a lot of people's uh, uh, wish lists, and I'm not going to go beyond that. I guess that's an interesting question, Vivek. If, if in the first year you're not going to rock the boat, I guess the question is, will you rock it at all? You see, I would question the premise, Sudhanand. I think that this notion that gradualism is, a, is an alibi for not doing anything is, is fundamentally mistaken. And, you know, as I've written myself, I think the right template for, uh, for to see a, or lens to, through which one sees Modi is not a Thatcher, but a Stephen Harper of Canada, Canada which is where he's going to be next week, who is, you know, Canada has transformed fundamentally and moved to the right, become much more conservative in economics and other ways in the last eight or ten years. But you can't point to a single big, you know, one huge reform that Harper took. So likewise, I think uh, Modi is plugging away bit by bit, and the land bill is a major investment of his capital, of his goodwill. Now, whatever one may think of it, I think it's a big improvement over the, the UPA's flawed bill. Is it perfect? No. Uh, but he has certainly, you know, gambled on the land bill as an important reform. Uh, labor, he said, look, let's work uh, on that through the states. And, and cooperative federalism isn't just a cliche. I mean, again, Canada and the U.S., when a seen reform happening by different states, trying different things, best practice percolates up. So I think that, 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 that there's merit uh, in, 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 in the Modi approach as well. And so that it, he may not rock the boat, but the boat is moving. Well, let me push you back on this, on the, on the Harper comparison, which is particularly interesting with the Prime Minister headed, headed to Canada. Um, I'm not an expert on, on, on Canadian politics, but my sense is that Harper is someone who is uh, viewed as a conviction politician. It's hard to imagine a Stephen Harper, for example, doing something like setting up the Mudra Bank, which sounds to me like, you know, just another, you know, government bank made to target small businesses, which we've seen many of these failed things in the past. Um, we've seen the Modi government really quite reluctant to move on privatization, in fact, slower than the last BJP government under Vajpayee. So would it be fair to say that Harper does seem to have some kind of ideological coherence and one doesn't see that, or certainly not to the same extent in this government? Well, I mean, I would partially agree. I think, you know, you know uh, Modi is a pragmatist. I mean, certainly there are things in which he believes. But I do think that there is, if, you know, one adds together the, small, the smaller and the bigger things he's done, there is a move towards making India more business friendly. I mean, make in India we haven't talked about, but if that does succeed, and uh, there's a lot of debate about what it actually means, but if India actually can become uh, a, a, if not a global hub, then a bigger player in manufacturing, then a whole lot of reforms have to follow that. I mean, labor, land, infrastructure. So there are many things that make in India, if in, in fact the government does push ahead with it, uh, and you've, you, know, you can question that if you want, uh, will uh, uh, you know, 
show a, a path towards a more business friendly and you know like one can then say well is that really a consumer friendly model but it's uh, but so I would say no I think there is a, a, a vision of some kind he's been very slow careful pragmatic and as I think you know so 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 was Harper in my view Milan where do you come down on that yeah, I mean, look, I, I think he's obviously pragmatic. I think he's very reluctant to take major political risks. Uh, and I think, you know, the issue with the gradualist agenda is, you know, I largely agree with Vivek, but even the gradualism sometimes comes across as half-baked, right? So, uh, you know, bringing down public ownership of, 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 of PSU banks to 52 percent, I mean, I'm not sure that's a big bag reform. I'm not sure it's that painful, but you know, the same headlines we saw in September from Jaitley saying he was going to do this, we're now seeing, you know, on April 7th say, yes, we plan to do it, but it, you know, it hasn't been forthcoming. Even on the competitive federalism front, you know, if you look at a map of India, you see that everything west of Delhi from Haryana to Goa is one big piece of BJP real estate, right? And Mihir has made this point. Now, where is the PM using the bully pulpit to say, you know, Let's lead by example, and we're not just talking about, you know, a couple of reforms in Rajasthan, you know, really doing something bold and progressive, saying we are going to set off this process of policy diffusion of learning, and, and we're going to show that this is workable and can be electorally popular. And these are places where the BJP uh, controls the levers of power. Modi has gotten many of these folks elected. They don't have elections for another you know, until 2018, 2019. So, you know, but we haven't seen that. So even I think the competitive federalism thing rings a little bit hollow. Mihir, what do you think of that? Well, I think that absolutely the, the one thing that I had wanted uh, uh, the Prime Minister to stand up and say was that, look, from Gurgaon to Mumbai, I'm creating a liberal BJP special economic zone in some sense, which will have uniform regulations, uniform licenses, um, you know, I will make that, you know, make that a really, really good uh, place to do business, and then the rest of the country will have to follow suit. Um, I don't think he's shown much interest in that, and I have a theory as to why. Um, maybe we are being too narrow about our spectrum of possible reformers. Um, you know, uh, Vivek has said um, Stephen Harper. I view Modi much more as an... Um, Asian state capitalism infrastructure builder kind of guy. Uh, not even a Lee Kuan Yew, more a Mahatsir almost. Somebody who will control the levers of power, you know, expects a 10, 15 year period in which he will transform the country in uh, both socially and in terms of building infrastructure, um, but not really create the kind of localized entrepreneurial market economy that we, that maybe a lot of us would have liked to see. But the net effect of that, Meher, would still be prosperity. I mean, Mahathir, I mean, for all his Absolutely. flaws, it was successful. I mean, the degree to which you think the, the Mahathir solution uh, would work in a country which is going through a demographic bulge and is much larger, we can disagree about that. It will definitely be transformative in a particular way. Whether it will be enough, I disagree, but I mean, I think your mileage may vary. Vivek, why don't you jump in? more Mahathir than Harper? Well, again, I know I don't think so. I think that's perhaps uh, a, a negative or an unfair way to see the Make in India campaign. Sure, I mean, one can see Modi as trying to engineer a state capitalist approach to, you know, manufacturing and, and employment. Uh, and, but I, instead, the way that I look at it is, look, what we need to have is we've got to fix infrastructure, we've got to fix red tape, fix corruption, uh, and now, then let the chips fall where they may. If, if, if India might become a hub for services, for you know, for agribusiness, something else, um, and one will unleash entrepreneurial energies. If someone can actually get their stuff to the market, if they have twenty-four-seven power and so on, if not being hassled to pay bribes, so all of these things that sound like minor reforms, I think uh, will unleash entrepreneurship, and we don't quite know what shape that will take, and it may not be at all a state capitalist Mahathir type of model, it may end up being something quite different. The way that, you know, no one foresaw the, you know, the boom in IT. That just came out of nowhere. Um, and if, if indeed, now again, you know, it, it, it's still an if, it's early days, but if just getting the basics right, infrastructure, corruption, red tape, bureaucracy, 
those things can unleash entrepreneurship. And I think the outcome of that is, is one that we just don't know. But it could be quite different than, than we imagine right now, Sadanand. I guess, you know, if, I, if I'm sort of, if I if I'm understanding the three of you correctly, I think that you have a, there's a, there's a broad agreement on what is happening. I think there's a disagreement on how significant it is. And uh, you, I, I think, Milan, you think that things are going in the right direction, but what's happening may not be enough. Is, would that be correct? I mean, I think if you, you know, think about a couple of facts about the Indian economy, right? So at least as of, you know, the mid to late 2000s, you know, 75% of the economy belonged to traditional incumbents, meaning either state-owned enterprises or firms, you know, like the Tatas and all, which had been incorporated long before the 1990s. You had firms in heavily concentrated industries dominated by public sector players, which had been very successful at parrying changes to increasing foreign entry into the economy, right? You had never had, even through the first NDA regime, any public sector undertaking located in the home state of the minister in charge of that PSU privatized. Now, are any of those facts different today, and will they likely be different uh, after a first uh, Modi term? I'm not sure of that answer. And I, so I, I, I sort of think that that tells me that things are likely to be more along the lines that we've seen you know, over the past you know, 10 or 15 years than, than different. But they would turn around and say that... Uh Growth is up. India is going to grow at above eight uh, percent. FDI is soaring, uh, about almost forty percent up in the last financial year. Uh, foreign FII inflows are up about four hundred percent. Why rock the boat? Would be would be there, and and so they would say that what what Arvind Subramaniam called creative incrementalism um, not only adds up, but is sufficient given where India is right now. I mean, I think it depends what your objective is, right? I mean, I could see uh, because of the positive global environment, low oil prices, the other emerging markets not doing particularly well, India anyway coming out of a cyclical downturn, you know, being okay, right? Growing at a reasonable rate for the next few years. But the question is, what is our time horizon? I mean, I, I, I thought that what he was after and what the government was after was having a sustained... Asia-like takeoff where we see high growth rates for, you know, two decades plus, right? So it depends what your time horizon is. I have no doubt that investors are going to come in and make a ton of money in the next few years as they, as they have been already. But, you know, I'm not sure that that should be, uh, that should be our benchmark necessarily. Meher, what's your sense of the benchmark? Um, I, I'm, I, I, can't, I can't speak. I'm a little confused like everybody else is about the, the, the details of the exact growth numbers right now. But... The one thing that I will say is that I want to take everyone back to 2004, 2003, 2004. India looks like it's growing a lot. It has seen a big increase in uh, financial uh, flows in. Everyone is extremely optimistic. There's a new government that's coming in that wants to, you know, build enormous amounts of infrastructure in 10 years. Uh, that went wrong not just because it was a bad government, but because the decisions that they took in the good times weren't far-reaching enough. And then when the bad times came, they were struggling. We are we're on the cusp again in this, con in this country of good times. We're on the, you know, on, uh, in that, 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 that upward, upwardly sloping part of the business cycle. Um, if you don't make your big politically difficult reform at this point, then the lesson of the past 10 years is, you A, don't make it, and B, run into trouble because you haven't made it. Well, let me take that to Miller. I mean, I, I would argue that if you compare this to NDA 1 again, which is widely regarded as a, as a government that did, did uh, make some reforms, I mean, as I recall, their first 18 months were a disaster. And it's only afterwards that you sort of... So is it true? I mean, I, I know that, you know, in the West we tend to see, think that you have to do things, you know, the first three months, first hundred days, and so on. And if you don't do things quickly, it normally means you're not going to get to them at all. But is that the record in India, Milan? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I think here's the problem, right? Is that uh, the world is very uncertain. I mean, just take the Delhi elections, right? I mean, I've now heard from numerous people, me here and, and Vivek can can corroborate or not, that you know what. The finance ministry in Jaitley had been planning with regard to subsidies was far more aggressive than what was contained in the budget. Until the route in Delhi, 
and then, of course, looking ahead to Bihar, where the PM and, and Amit Shah and others intervene to say we cannot go this far this fast because we're already being termed anti-farmer and we can't, that's a bad thing, and, you know, going into Bihar, you know, which is another eight, nine months down the road, uh, we can't be seen as sort of anti-poor, right? So the question is, you know, so Rahm Emanuel has this famous line, right, from the early Obama years of, a, you know, a crisis is a horrible thing to waste, right? And India was basically in a crisis uh, when Modi came over. Uh, and the question is, you know, is that window going to be closing? Because there will always be another Bihar down the road. I mean, the remarkable thing is the gap between the Delhi elections and the Bihar elections is probably the longest you're going to get in an Indian electoral cycle, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a matter of several months. Uh, and, you know, so look at oil prices, right? I mean, everything is premised on very optimistic assumptions about where oil prices are going to be. Now, if that changes, what happens to this very precarious fiscal math, right? All of a sudden, that gets totally thrown out of whack. And I'm not sure that while, of course, people are aware in government uh, that this is an issue, they have a plan B. Vivek, would you like to respond to that? I, yes, I thanks. Uh, uh, I, I'll do that. Uh, my, look, my own sense is uh, we would love, you know, as an economist, I would love if they were pushing ahead faster and, and more aggressively on reforms. And I agree with me here that there's a danger of becoming complacent, that times are good, oil is cheap, uh, you know, the current account is, is under control, inflation is falling, and so on, that, that uh, this is the time to push ahead. But yet, I think part of the problem is everyone has also drawn, I think, the wrong lessons from 2004. This, that it's still, there's still this notion that, you know, somehow... If you, if you campaign aggressively on the economy. Now, it's true that Modi won because of the economy or the sense that the UPA had faltered on the economy and corruption and, and governance more broadly. But the basic political economy of India has not shifted enough, in my view, to the point where someone like a Modi or whoever could, you know, could shout from the rooftops uh, like a Thatcher that, look, we are campaigning on the economy, on individual liberty, and so on. We just haven't gotten there. Uh, so my hope is, my wish and my hope is, that that these small reforms will start to add up, and then people, maybe civil society groups, you know, people, uh, events like this, uh, will start making the case for the market economy more aggressively, intellectually, sharply than has been made in India, and then that will shift us to a to a situation where then yes, Modi or someone else could say, look, let's come out and actually uh, declare ourselves to be a genuinely center-right party but we're committed to a free market, to capitalism, that, that capitalism is not you know, anti-poor and anti-farmer. And I think, to be fair, though, to Modi on the land bill, he has been saying those things. But I Mayor, mean, he, isn't, they, they, Mayor, isn't your argument kind of you know, the inverse of that? I mean, the land bill shows that if he really wanted to, he could use his bully pulpit. Absolutely. I, I, I thought the land bill thing was very interesting because here was something where which is extremely politically risky, where you lay yourself open to all sorts of accusations, fair or unfair is irrelevant, about uh, being pro-company, pro-corporate and anti-farmer. But, you know, the Prime Minister pushed ahead regardless. He used a state-run radio to make his case. He was aggressive about the opposition. Uh, um, attacks on him, and um, he, he continues to want to push it through. So on the places where I think he himself is convinced, he will put uh, political capital at risk. I think what we have to accept is that a lot of what we want him to do, he himself is not convinced of the value of. He does not see it necessarily as being worth expending that political capital on. So there is a battle to be fought, not just for you know the public at large, but I think also for the solo Mr. Modi. Now let's turn to a few questions we've got from Twitter. This this is from someone called Arihant Panagaria. His handle is Arihant P, and I'm going to shoot this at uh, Milan. Uh, Arihant asks, much has been made out of Modi's success in the area of foreign policy. Do you think it has? it has resulted in any economic benefit yet? Uh, I mean, I think to the degree his foreign visits, including his visit to Washington, uh, is correlated with sentiment, and I think it is, 
uh, I think that's been very healthy, right, in terms of sending the right positive vibes about where India is heading, that it's open for business again, that we're going to listen to your concerns and actually take some of these things on board, which is a message that, that frankly, you know, uh, many companies hadn't been hearing in the final years of the UPA too. And so I do think in terms of, you know, inflows and a decision to look again at India, uh, I think those those foreign foreign trips are are important. And I think, you know, there is the possibility still out there, you know, just thinking about the U.S.-India relationship, for instance, that there could be some some big ticket items, right? So one of the things that's on the anvil is this idea of, of, of the United States and, and, and India jointly developing an aircraft carrier, right, which is a hugely expensive, long gestation project. My colleague Ashley Tellis is, has a new paper coming out on this, which is, you know, that could be something which is quite important, you know, and I think there are numerous other things like that. So I think on balance it's been it's been successful, although the question that, you know, one has to ask is what's the opportunity cost, right? I mean, of all of this world travel, are there things at home he hasn't been doing? And, and, and it's a good question. I don't have a great answer. And to wrap up, let's just, let's, let's talk about the future. And I'd like each of you to talk about three things that you think, I mean, in your case, Vivek, you think things are going pretty well. So let's say, in your case, what are the three things that you'd like to see over the course of the next year that would make you feel that they're going even better and in the case of Mayer and Millen, I would sort of ask, I would phrase that question differently and ask you, what would make you change your minds and think and say decisively that this person really is an economic reformer? But let's start with Vivek. I would say uh, stick to your guns with the land bill. Make the case, make the argument that it's not uh, anti-poor and anti-farmer, and get the land bill through the GST. We've all said it's been hanging fire that it could be, again, a, a, you know, flying below the radar screen, potentially hugely important reform, finally knit India into a single market. And third, I think uh, if looking towards the budget, if we actually now start to see some real fiscal, I mean, sort of clamp, uh, you know, tightening of, of the fisc, uh, and move, and actually, actually move down towards uh, the, the deficit target in a way that's credible, where you aren't sort of left, you know, cutting stuff in the final few months of the fiscal year. So I think fiscal reform, land, uh, and the GST are the three things I'm watching for, so that ends. Mihir, would those, would those three do it for you? Would they change your mind? Um, I think GST is going to happen. I think GST would have happened under anybody. Um, it had already developed enough of an institutional aspect uh, uh, behind it. Um, I think that the three things that would change my mind are essentially a focus on factor markets, so if he figures out that land isn't just about land acquisition through state power, land is about creating a genuine, flexible market for it. So working on improving the access to title to land, the ability to collateralize land, um, ending uh, a zoning patterns which are very, very restrictive in India, and developing a real market. That's one. The second thing is looking at labor reform. Fine, if you don't want to do it at the center, at least ensuring that all BJP states have a uniform labor law, follow Rajasthan in the method that they've done it, and say that you know, we will allow for flexibility in this Gurgaon to uh, Mumbai manufacturing belt. And third, um, administrative reform. And I think that this is really the most important thing. It was the first thing that Manmohan Singh um, wanted to focus on when he became prime minister. He did nothing about it. Um, I think that the problems of the Indian government are uh, largely a question of the ineptitude of the Indian state, the mechanisms that the Indian state uses as a regulatory body, as an enabling body, need to be fixed, and there hasn't been any thinking about that yet. If I begin to see thinking of that in the on that in the next six to eight months, I'll be a very happy man. Milan? Yeah, I mean, I think three things I'd put on the list. I mean, one is I think he has a has a golden opportunity to do something on subsidy reform. I think the the so-called jam strategy that was laid out in the economic survey gives him a path. I would like him to be more aggressive and, and have encourage experimentation. There are a bunch of different models that don't all involve going right away to cash and mobile money. There's a huge spectrum. I'd like to see, secondly, what to echo Meher's point on the state stuff, I mean, by some estimates, 50% of the value of stalled projects are in NDA-ruled states. I mean, these are places where he can directly make the case 
not just being passive and saying, okay, Rajasthan wants to do X, will allow for that uh, state law to, to, to contravene the central law, but actually go out and campaign for that. I think the third thing, which is a, a, a big deal that he has to deal with in one way or another, whether it's a big reform or little reform, is the banks. Uh, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not an economist, but it seems to me it's very hard to get the investment cycle going again unless you deal with these with the public sector banking system. And I'm not sure that they have a coherent or cogent plan to do that. Well, with that, we are out of time. Thank you very much, all three of you, for this discussion. And thank you, all of you who watched online and joined us in this Hangout. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.